Hey, you know, how many of you got a bunch of Christmas gifts this week? Anybody? How many got just one? Just one gift. Okay, that's okay. Hey, how about you guys in the, in the camera on there? Y'all doing art? Did y'all get gifts? Are you there getting gifts now? Put the gifts down and listen to me, okay? <laughs> yeah, whether you're here or there, we thank you for being part of our church. And we know a lot of people out of town will have a lot of viewers, uh, whether it's right now, live, or later. We have people that view all week, come time. And I know some of you that are able to be here today, if you were out of town visiting family, you would do the same, right? You would be sure to watch the service when the old guy preaches. No? Okay. <laughs> I see you grinning at me. Hopefully that's true. Uh, just want to say we love you. Thank you. The several of you both online and here gave toward blessing the pastors. And we feel overwhelmed with your love and generosity to us. With the Christmas gift this year. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for serving. Thank you for being a great church, for loving each other, uh, for all that you do for the kingdom of God, from yard work to snow work to nursery work to cleaning work to teaching work to praying work to uh, working with kids and youth and adult ministries, all kinds of things. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I had one couple, and I know they'll be mad if I mention their name, but I thought it was the sweetest thing. After the Christmas uh, Eve service, uh, Friday night, we had chairs brought in because our four o'clock is by far really, really full in the, in the Christmas Eve. And, and so we had set up a bunch of chairs and we didn't want them all out and they'd get them up there. And, and then our person that typically cleans, we, we were, this person was being mindful of them because it's Friday night, Saturday's Christmas. And so they, this couple says, Hey, need some help cleaning up and straightening up. And so in they came and, and the four executive pastors, myself, and Jeff and Brian and Austin are all here. And we moved all the chairs, went through all the pews, cleaned everything up, cleaned up the bathrooms, and made things ready for today. And I want to say that to say this, is that I think that we have to keep in mind that a church is a different institution than a business. You know, we're, we aren't CEOs and all of that. We're servants of the Most High God. Jesus said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And I just want to say to you, those of you that do that stuff that no one is seeing week in and week out, God sees it. And I'm not trying to take away the thunder of that. I'm just trying to say, we serve too. And there's nothing that's too big or too little that we wouldn't do to do our best. So I would want you to call us. And at the close of the message, sometimes I have a feeling the Holy Spirit spoke to me to do this. I've never done this. But I think there's people online that might want to talk to me. And I'm going to give you my cell number, 515-778-4524, 778-4524. Text me, and I'll call you back, and I'll be glad to talk with you pray with you. Today's message was downloaded in the middle of the night to me, and then in a couple of other moments, also at times when the Holy Spirit gave it to me. We talked about the Christmas series, and um, we talked about the topic, and uh, the topic that I got was the greatest gift, and of course, you know what that is, Jesus, right? Yeah. What's the greatest gift that someone's ever given you besides Jesus? Uh, what, what's the greatest, maybe, maybe tell someone, what, what is that great gift? Uh, husbands, you just blew it because you should have said, <laughs> I mean, come on, did any wife ever, did anyone turn to their, you did? Ja uh, way to go, Jackie. Give it up for Jackie. Yeah, baby, you did a good job. That's right. Well, there's a lot of things that are gifts. You know, Jesus is the greatest gift, and he gives so much. It's like, how do you sort out what does God does for us and give to us? He gives so much. He does so much. He's so amazing. Jesus is amazing. And uh, in Matthew, this is the day after Christmas. So we look after Christmas in Matthew. When it says, the, chapter 2, the visit of the, of the wise men. By the way, this is called Wise Man Sunday. Because wise men still seek him. Online, you're seeking him. You're out of town, different states, you're watching. Or you made a point to get online and watch after the fact. That tells me something about your heart, that it matters. 
And also, if you're gone with your kids and you sit down as a family and make a point to take in the worship service, that tells your children something and your grandchildren about what you think of serving the Lord and worshiping the Lord. But it says that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, and, and I've been there in Jerusalem right where the wise men came, right where Herod's castle was, right where he was at this time. And he said, <clears throat> they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They're going after him. They're going a, a long way out of their way to get him, to find him. They're pursuing him. Why do you think Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? The thing, the number one thing is Jesus, to seek him. They, they're looking for him. They're going for him. For we saw, it says, we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And so then we jump over the rest of the story. So Herod is an idiot, right? He's a maniac. He wants to be immortal. He is immortal. Built stuff. He's a nutcase. Killed wives because they, he, they threatened his throne. Killed his own kids because they were threatening his throne. Now they're killing Jesus Christ. The Messiah is trying to kill him. He killed a bunch of babies trying to figure out and just wiped out whatever was in Bethlehem. A nutcase. You know a lot of nutcases in the world today too. You want to hear that? I could do that instead of this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Verse 9. I won't go there. Verse 9, I pick up in Matthew chapter 2. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them. And I'm, by the way, reading the NASB, and later when, when you've got other verses up, you'll, you'll see me reading this, and it'll be NIV. But this is the New American Standard Version. He said... The star, they went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Now Micah the prophet prophesied that the, the Christ child, the Messiah, would be, would, would be born in Bethlehem. So when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceeding with great joy because they knew the star was going to lead them. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, what my heart is for every person in the world, those of you that are here, anyone that I could influence, is not to think highly of me or any other leader, but to think highly of Jesus and offer your life, which is represented in these gifts, to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords Jesus, to seek after him, to know him, and to worship as they bow down when they fell to the ground that means I'm undone it's not about me and when a person dies they fall down if you see them have a heart attack they fall to the ground and they're dead and Jesus says to take up your cross daily and follow me in other words live as dead men that not your will matters but God's will matters and so here we are on the day after Christmas as wise people men and women seeking the Savior, wanting the Savior. I ask you a question. What if everyone that I asked this question to would work together and come together and do it together as the body of believers? If I said, do you really want everything God has to be full of him and to see God move so strong where the Holy Spirit is so thick that men and women would come and be undone like Isaiah when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and cried, I am a man of unclean lips and fell before God. Do you want to see the Holy Spirit show up and Jesus be so powerful that your life is so full that you live and breathe? And as Paul said, I have your being in him. In him, I move and have my being. If everyone, like when we've had these special weeks where we bring in a guest and say this is a time when we're seeking more of God. This is a time of renewal that we all come like on a Sunday night where there's plenty of time. Just come, fill the house with those that really want to see God move and build the culture of seeking God like wise men, falling before him, worshiping him, praying to him, believing for him. You see, Sunday night service wasn't just a tradition written in the Bible. You know where it came from? It came from when God began to move, they wanted more. 
They didn't want to just attend on a Sunday morning. They wanted more. And they wanted the time, not that they, you know, worry about where they were going to like linger and to seek. And I would, I would, I would say to you that in January, first part of February, we're going to have seeking services. We're going to have a series of messages that the pastors are going to preach. And it's all going to be about going after God and seeing the hand of God move with a mighty revival and his Holy Spirit showing up and people being changed and the church being set on fire and moving from being lukewarm to burning toward God. And I would ask you, if you really want to see that, if we filled the house, can you imagine the house filled just worshiping God? and seeking God, and God wouldn't get God's attention. And I know there's so many of you that want that, but you don't think of the power of when you come together, two or three, there I'm in the midst. And when we gather together and we cry out to God, there's a power in that. So I wanna encourage you as we move into the new year to renew yourself, to seek the Lord like wise men. So my message is the greatest gift, Jesus. And the first thing I want you to see about Jesus, why he's the greatest gift, is what he gave. What did he give? Well, he gave you life, right? Lowell, aren't you glad that God gave Tamara life? You'd be married to some, I don't even know. <laughs> aren't you glad, Pastor Jeff, that God gave life to Henry and Doris? That's a private joke. That's their character that they're all spiritually proud. Aren't you glad that God gave life to you and gave life to your children and your grandchildren that we can live? Well, life is hard, isn't it? People hurt. There's war. There's trouble. There's hatred. There's trouble everywhere, right? But the gift of life is a beautiful thing. We should love him and he should be most because he gives life. He breathes life into us. He made us both male and female, and breathe life, that we could go and breathe life on others of his Holy Spirit with us within us. I'm thankful for life. It's not always easy. I have my aches and pains. You know why I think we have aches and pains when we get older? Because God is warning you, you're gonna die and stand before God. Oh, I'm serious. You know what's a good friend? A leave. <laughs> Life, from birth to the grave, life. Then the second thing that is great is creation. Have you ever traveled? Have you been even around the U.S.? The Rocky Mountains, the, I mean, Smoky Mountains, the rivers, the oceans, the valleys, the beauty, the splendor, all of animal creation, going to a zoo, having your little dog that you love. My daughter and her husband, they're wonderful people and, you know, they're musically talented, but they don't always think clear. They think that Lucille is a human and Lucille is a little dog. They talk to that dog like it's human. They th Do any of you think your dog or cat is human? Raise your hand. They're, oh, they're not the only ones. <laughs> they named their dog after my mother who used to whine and complain that we never named any of our kids after her. <laughs> See? Something not all okay with that. Shout out to you guys in wherever you are. In-laws, their way. Yeah. Uh, and it's tempting to me to start naming a bunch of names now that people where they are out of state, because I know a lot of that, you know, like Glenn and St. Louis and different ones of my friends, they're all over. I know people all over the world. Life is good, creation is wonderful. Man, I tell you, you wanna go somewhere fun? The most beautiful place on this planet I've ever seen is Lucerne, Switzerland. Look it up, look at the pictures at it. It's amazing, gorgeous, beautiful, in my ass, amazing. Best place ever. Anyway, but I like living here because I like y'all, you Iowans. Next thing that I'm thankful for, not only life and creation, but money. Okay, you say, well, pastor, that just sounds wrong. What did Jesus say about money? The love of money is the root of all evil. I'm thankful for money. How many are you thankful for money? If you're not thankful for money, would you give me yours? <laughs> right? Okay, so, but you gotta keep it in perspective, right? That's why Jesus taught us things. In fact, when he made creation, 
He gave everything to Adam and Eve in the garden. And he said of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you don't touch it. Why? Because every time they walked through the garden, they saw that tree. You don't touch that. Reminded them God owns everything. This is the symbol that God owns everything. You know what the symbol is to us to remind us that God owns everything? The tithe. And money will get a hold of you and ruin you. And you'll start worshiping it and everything it can buy. And everything it can buy will distract you from really following God because it'll give you so many opportunities that when you should be worshiping God or praying or reading the Bible, you're on the lake or you're wherever else because you can afford anything and everything and you're going to and fro and not worshiping God. So the Bible says that we rob him with what? Tithes and offerings, not just Tithes are not just offering. In other words, the tithe. And the Bible says the tithe belongs to God. It's something you pay to God. You don't designate it because it's not yours. It belongs to God. Bring it into the storehouse, not to another parachurch ministry, but it's how God funds the church, the tenth, one-tenth. And then offerings you can rob God. That's extra things the Holy Spirit gives you to give, speaks to you to give. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's multiple types of offerings from from the tithe to the benevolence to other kinds of things. And Jesus deals with it in the Sermon on the Mount when he goes, he says, when you do your alms or you give to the poor, he's confronting the priests who are doing it with the wrong motive because they wanted to be looked up to. Look, look at me, look what I'm doing, look what I'm giving. You know, look, look, look at how I'm doing this. And, and he's confronting the attitude in the giving, the heart of the giving. Some of you are looking at me and you're going, you're talking about money on the day after Christmas? Well, let me ask you a question. Is God first or not? Okay? So if in December you give all your money you make to family and everyone else with presents, but you don't remember God first, is that, or could that be a problem with your heart? Could be. Maybe not, but I'm not a judge. Only God is, but just think about that. But I am thankful for money. Come on. And if you need some money and you're here or you're online and you're part of our fellowship, call me because we want to help you. Because sitting here are people that get what I'm talking about and they give. In fact, y'all know that last month in November, the church gave $10,000 to benevolence. Y'all did into the benevolent fund. And we sent out several thousands of dollars because we've had it in fund to help many different people and several in our church because they, they got COVID and missed like three weeks of work. They couldn't work or whatever else happened, and people that their income is different, we would never embarrass them. But let me just say thank you. Thank you, because it matters. Jesus has, has principles that we live by so that he, we keep focused. And I'm telling you, everything that he provides us, just like Matthew 6 says, don't look at the sparrows, you know, uh, they, I, I feed them. They're not worried about what food they're going to get. Look at the fields. I clothe them with the beautiful flowers, you know, and he's going to take care of us. Put him first. Seek first. And that whole chapter is dealing with you either follow God or you follow money and what it can buy. You can't do both. That's why he says if you're a rich man, it's more difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven than, the, than for a a camel to go through an eye of a needle, which is impossible to do. But then he says, but with God, all things are possible. And it is. Money is not the problem. I want all of you rich, 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 but not if it's going to take your heart from God. Does that make sense? But God never promised you that. There's poor people. I was poor. I know what it's like to end up with a dollar in my checking account at the end of the month. Grew up poor, I understand it. I grew up, when I was really young, going to bed hungry. But my dad taught me, he said, money's only good for what it can do for others. Let it be loose, let it flow through you. Look around, what can you do with it to help others? Just remember that. Be thankful for it. God gave us the provisions of everything we need. And then this is another thing he gave us. I mean, you talk about which, which one of these gifts are the best? I think they're all wonderful. How about friends? I got so many friends and they're all over the world. And some of you are your friends, but I want you to be more friends. But you only got so much time. I mean, I, I'm looking out at you and I'm thinking, man, I wish I could spend like a week with you. Just, no, I'm not trying to be weird. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Just like interacting. Just, I love people. I want to know you. 
I want to really know you. I don't want to, I don't want to love you for what you get, give, and I don't want to love you for what you do. By the way, you know, the reason I set up the church in the beginning, that no one, no leaders, just those that enter the giving, and then that's hard because there's multiple people that do that to know what people give. No pastors. We can't just go on and look to see what you're giving because that way I can, I just assume you're always, you're doing it, you know, and I, I, I can talk freely because I don't know, and I'm glad I don't know. Occasionally, something will come in the mail, and I'll open and see something, but I'm not looking at your giving records. No, neither is any pastor. But friends, man, they matter. Some friends that are generous, I don't love them because they're generous, what they give. I love them for who they are. Recently, I was with a friend that I just love being with. I just, and I was a lot of my friends like that. I could just sit and breakfast is my favorite food and I could sit there for four, five, six hours just listening, talking about life. The people that think deep, talk about theology. Some of you are like that. I wish I could spend more time with a lot of you. A couple of you I don't really care to, but most of you I'm good. <laughs> God's gonna get me. <laughs> Someone said God's gonna get me for saying that. I'm kidding. Gotta put a little sugar on the message, you know. But, uh, you know, I just sit in there and just join this person and we just, sometimes just, we don't have to speak, you know, you just love each other for who you are, sharing life together. And I thought, man, I love this guy. He's 80 years old. He's one of the most remarkable people I've ever known. The Holy Spirit said, do you love me as much as you love him? Do you want to be with me as much as you want to be with him? What a great friend. And I was just sitting there thinking, I, I, I want to have breakfast with you, Jesus. So when you see me at hy the best breakfast in America, <laughs> order the scrambled eggs softly and the bacon perfect, me, medium, it's great. Uh, but when you see me there and I'm alone, I'm going to be not alone. I'm going to be fellowshipping with Jesus. And in my mind, he's going to be right there. And I'm going to be listening to the God thoughts that he drops in my mind. Because Jesus is the best gift. And that's what I, I want with my life, to be with Jesus. He's the great, greatest friend. And then the next thing that he gave us is family. Oh, my goodness. I mean, when I got my wife, I thought, what is wrong with her? Why did she say yes? I mean, why would she marry me? Because, I mean... There was a time, you know, they, they, Baylor University, they call them the Baylor Beauties. And let me tell you something. I was preaching on not marrying for just the physical attraction, you know, marrying for who the person is, which, which she is a very spiritual person. And I learned later, I thought it was because of my sexy legs that she married me, but it was actually because I was spiritual that she married me when she straightened me out on that. But anyway, she was like amazing, gorgeous, you know. And I was telling I was telling the church, you know, marry not just for how the person looks, marry for who they are, you know. And, and I said, you know, I was, I'd probably be honest. I'm married for how she looked. I said, I mean, my wife had the best wheels around. And I said that, and the teenagers come up wanting to know what kind of car she drove. <laughs> and for those of you that might be younger, wheels back then was legs. Yeah, so just tell you didn't know that. And back then there were short shorts. If I'd have been a preacher, I'd have been a preaching against them, but I wasn't. <laughs> I was in college. Anyway, man, you can't beat family. You got a wife. Then I got kids. I'm thinking, man, I love my wife, but these kids. I mean, you know, like there's a love for your wife, but it's a different type of love. And you could never love your spouse more than you love them everything, but then you can't never love your kids more than everything. And then I got really surprised when grandkids came along. Holy cow, what, what kind of emotion is that? That's when, that's when old people lose their brain. It's like, I mean, I'm telling you right now, grandkids will pick you clean. Just wait, Scott. You just wait, buddy. You get those grandkids, that's it, buddy. Your money's out the door, over. Family, what a gift. And then church is the next one. What we do, you know, people say, well, we don't need the church. We, you know, I don't need to worship God. I don't need to go to church. I can follow God. I don't need the church. Why do you say that? First off, the church isn't the building. It's the people. We are the church. And we need each other. 
And the Bible gave out gifts for the church, like pastor and teacher and evangelist, and prophet and apostle, etc., and other people, organizers, you know. There's other gifts there, right? And so we all matter. Everything everyone does matters. He gives the church, but we need to be together. That's why he says, in the end times, you're gonna see hard times coming. Persecution is gonna rise. Sin is gonna abound, the love of many will wax cold. He says, when you see all these signs like we're seeing now, because Jesus could come, I'm telling you, in 22, I would not be surprised Jesus comes back. He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. The church is the people gathering together and how important it is to do that. Did you know that a Barna survey said that 30% of people that used to attend church before all this craziness going on with COVID and all that, they'll never be back to church. Southern Baptists had the same survey and the same survey in their denomination said the exactly same thing. You know what I've experienced here? Exactly the same thing. We have 30% of people, and maybe some of you are watching, never come back. Now, if it's for a reason because you have an extreme health condition and you're being careful, I get that, but you just kind of got out of the habit. Why does a person not want to be with the people if they have Jesus in them? The people that Jesus loves, you want to be with those people to love them. You know, when you come to church, you don't come for yourself. We have a, we have a selfish generation, self-first world, especially in America where there's plenty. People come for self. What do I get? When you do that, you evaluate, and if you don't get what you want, then you don't like church. But church isn't about self. It's not about a song and a sermon. It's about a body. We're the body of Christ. It's what's happening in the foyer, in small groups at the home, in classes. See, it's Jesus first. You come for Jesus. To worship Jesus, to love Jesus, and to minister for Jesus. Then putting others second. You come preferring one another in love, looking to see what I can do to notice someone that walk in that may be thinking about suicide and comes to church and you meet them and you look them in the eye and you show them love, you show them a warm smile and a welcome instead of that's where I sit. You're in my seat. Uh-oh, I'm meddling now. So Jesus first, <laughs> then others, and then you. That's joy, isn't it? Jesus, others, you. Yeah. Yes, you need to benefit. But when you give, what does it do? It comes back at you. When you worship Jesus, he fills you, he gives you back. He inhabits the praise of his people. When you minister to others, others will flow back and minister to you. People go, well, I had this problem and not one person cared or reached out. Why? Because you never built the bridge when they had a problem. You weren't there for them when they had the problem. When you go to them, you're building a bridge when they're in trouble. Now, when you're in trouble or you need a friend, you've built the bridge because you were there for them and now they come back. I remember a friend of mine named Larry, one of the best people that I've ever known. And there's a friend, as soon as my dad died within minutes, he was at my door and I'll never forget it. He knows how to be a friend. Friends matter. Family matters. The church matters. It's the body of Christ. So be in church. Come together with believers. Be a part. The Bible, was that, isn't that a great gift? The living word of God. In the beginning was the word. The word is with God. The word was God and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, even as the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth is Jesus Christ. This word, when you read it, needs to be daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. What is that? Praying and trusting God, living day by day. But there's also another, another measure because we know Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. In other words, when you read this word, it becomes alive, it becomes food. Can you imagine? You had a good dinner yesterday because you matter not imagine not eating today, not eating tomorrow, not eating the next day, eating you know, that old food. Well, it's not nourishing you very much. You remember what it was like. You know about that food. You remember what it tasted like, but you're not feeling full. Let me tell you something. If you want the best gift, this comes alive, it's Jesus. And when you take time to be with Jesus, with his word, sitting at a restaurant, and Jesus is right across from you, no one else can see him, but he's right there. And you're walking and talking with him, and you're dwelling with him, and you're abiding him, and him in you, and you are walking one another. That's, that's when Jesus comes alive, the Bible. How much greater gift? It says in the psalm, it says that, that the words are, are sweeter also, uh, they're, they're like gold and very fine gold and sweeter than honey and sweeter than the honeycomb. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Hallelujah. This book is life. You dwell in it. Be like a tree planted by the water, according to Psalm 1. A word, the Bible, it's wonderful. The next thing you see is 
is uh, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus, in the Old Testament, they had to talk through prophets. God didn't dwell in man. But now, he's Emmanuel, God with us. He's with us. He's for us. He walks behind us, in front of us. He leads us. He leads us to all truth. The Holy Spirit is a great gift. But is, are any of these the greatest gifts? No, the giver is the greatest gift. Jesus gave these gifts. He's the greatest gift. But these things are wonderful. We need the Holy Spirit. What's the next gift he gave us? Well, his life. God gave to Jesus and Jesus gave his life. We see what he gave and what he did was die on the cross. He lived sinless. He died second, died on the cross for our sins. Third, he rose again and he saved us. He saved us from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death in hell, away from God. He saved us from the penalty, but he also saved us from the power of sin. And the, when we get saved from the power of sin, where sin dem, has dominion over us, and we can't help it, like the devil, like Flip Wilson used to say, I, I said, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil does cause a lot of things that are bad. We can blame him a lot. But guess what? The spirit of God that raised Jesus to the dead is stronger, and we don't have to be under the dominion of the enemy. We have the word of God and the spirit of God, and, and we've got Jesus. And let me tell you something. He saved us not only from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin that we can be overcomers in Jesus' name. He changes our heart to give us a new desire. But here's the thing. If Jesus is the Savior, then it means Jesus has to abide with us. we got to take time. Because the third point, not only what he gave us and what he did, but who he is. Jesus, I love him for who he is. How many of you, as parents and grandparents or individuals, are, as, a, as a, an employee, want to be loved for what you give or what you do. You know, a lot of religion is loving God for what he did and what he gives. What he gives and what he did. I want to be loved for who I am. I love Jesus for who he is. I was praying for my family one night. It was about 4.30 for about an hour. And I went through every name and I prayed for them, from my wife to my firstborn Taylor and then her husband my second born Austin and then his wife and my three grandkids and each one of them I was praying and I was thanking God for the character, for the heart, for the godliness, for all they were, all of the attributes of God in them. My wife, merciful, supportive, generous, kind to people, truthful with skill, and I went right down. I was just naming all these things. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And thinking that the nature of God is what makes our family cohesive and not divisive. That they are able to say, I was wrong, please forgive me. That they were able to forgive one another. And that we have love and we don't have brokenness for all of our immediate family. And not everyone can say that. But I was recognized it was Jesus in there. And I was just thanking them, thanking them, thanking them. And then God says, are you thankful for Jesus? The Spirit just said, are you thankful for Jesus? And it hit me, oh yes, Jesus, thank you for being part of our family. You're the main ingredient of our family. You're the main leader of our family. It's because of you that what we are, that I can thank God for all of these people. Jesus, you're the most important one. And I'm telling you, Jesus himself is the most important. You see, to know him, Oh, I want to know him, the prophet said. Paul says, I want to know him. Jesus says, he wants to know you. In fact, the penalty for having religion and caring about what God gave you and what he did for you, but not knowing him, is described by Jesus himself. Because you can, have, you can look good. You can know all this stuff. You can know the correct theology. Theology doesn't save you. Jesus does. You can do all the good stuff. You can do the stuff in church. You can do the stuff and say the right stuff and, and do all kinds of good things. But here's what, if you take a look at Matthew 7, 21 and 23, here's what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who deals the, does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And that's not talking about perfection. 
That's talking about a heart, like the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's a heart of want to follow God. That's what he's talking about, not perfection. And the re, the, what, what causes us to be able to follow God's voice to do his will is to hear his voice and his will. Therefore, you're in relationship and you're taking time to have breakfast with him so you can hear him clearly. And he says, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter, and many will say to me on that day, and these are religious people, and they're Pentecostal. Lord, Lord, we didn't, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, and I'm reading NASB, NIV's on the board, I never knew you, depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. King James says, ye workers of iniquity. And then I never knew you. New is an intimate word. Intimate. You know the voice. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. Are y'all with me? Yes. Do you really know Jesus? When I was a kid, the Gaither had a song, Do you know, do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my Lord, have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? Do you know Jesus? He wants to know you. He doesn't want you to know about him. He doesn't want you just to be thankful for what he gives and what he's done, but he wants to be, like John 15 says, abiding, abiding in him. John says, I'm the one he loved the most. Why? Because I think John was focused on the friendship, the relationship, and he could feel that. John got it. Martha was busy serving, but Mary just wanted to be with him. It's not what we do. It's not what we give. You Thank you for what you give, and thank you for what we do. It's important. Same way it's important to Jesus. But it's who you are. And every person needs to be loved based on who they are. And who they are becomes beautiful when Jesus is influencing you. My friend Steve Nordyke, he told me after he did this for me, he said the way you help a person learn how to be a friend is to be a good friend. You show them how it is you tell the truth. And the way you become like Jesus is being with him and he'll speak the truth with love. And the wounds of a friend, the words that hurt are faithful. Someone that's not your friend, they'll say all kinds of glamorous words, but the person that will tell you the truth that might hurt, those are the people I've learned to trust, not the ones that talk behind my back. If I get close enough to you and you've never said something to me, I was with my whole family, and it was my three-year-old granddaughter that said, Grandpa, you've got a crusty thing up in your nose. <laughs> Nobody else would speak the truth. It's true. I'll close with Philippians 3. Musicians, would you come? Philippians 3, verse 1. Paul is saying, finally, he's talking about the goal of life. My brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things again is no trouble to me as it is to safeguard for you. I think I'll read it off the screen because it is quite a bit different than NASB. It says, watch out for those dogs, talking about religious people. Why? The dogs, he's calling the people that are so religious, they're wanting to turn everybody into the Judea, Jew, uh, Jews tradition of, of, of uh, circumcision, right? And he's going, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. He's talking about circumcision. For it is we who are the circumcision who have served God by his spirit. In other words, we've been cut by those two-edged sword, the word of God. We, our hearts have been changed to be fixed the way God wants them by the spirit of God who boasts in Christ Jesus says, who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh or what you do, what you give, how you serve, 
how you, what you, whatever you think you're doing to, to be close to Jesus or to make heaven, whatever that is, you, you put confidence in the flesh. I have more reason than anybody, Paul says. I was circumcised on the eighth day, just the way a good Jewish boy should be done, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the best tribe, a Hebrew of Hebrews, the top of the list. In regard to the law, I followed it perfectly. I was a Pharisee. Remember, it's the Pharisees that said, you know, they tithe on every. Jesus told him, you, you tithe on the mint, you tithe on everything. They said, and he was kind of saying, what do you think you're doing? And some people think he meant you shouldn't have done this. And Jesus says, you should have tithed. That was the right thing. But you left the more important things undone. Truth, grace, mercy, the way you treat a person. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. I was faultless, I followed the law. But whatever were gains to me, in other words, whatever made me great in the Jewish church, whatever made me the name in America that everybody wants to listen to and watch, that preaches wrong stuff, because there's all a lot of that going on, whatever is gained to me, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. Because it's not about me, Paul's saying. It's no longer about me. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. Knowing, knowing. That's the intimate word. I know. You never knew me, depart from me. You weren't a relationship, you weren't intimate with me. You weren't my friend. We didn't walk and talk. You knew about me. You did things for me. You gave to me. You did ministry, you cast out demons, but I didn't know you. For whose sake I've lost all things. He's saying, I've died. Everything that mattered no longer matters. You don't, I don't need to be somebody. You know, people grow up, they want to be somebody. They want to be the top of the heap in their land. Now anymore in religion, people want to be the superintendent. They want to be the big dog. They want to be the number one name. They want to be the next Billy Graham. I just want to love Jesus and love you. In fact, when I started this church, I didn't want a lot of people. I, I just wanted like 300. They had to talk me into starting two services when it got too full. You know, I said, I said, I love people. I want to know people. We do another service. I won't know everybody. And some godly person said to me, well, it's not about you knowing everybody, Pastor. It's about everybody knowing Jesus. So get over yourself. So we started a second service when I said, thanks for that cut. I guess you're a real friend. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. That garbage word, that's dumb in the King James. D-U-N-G. It's what you do when you go sit on the toilet. And he counts everything that bad. Nothing he is is good. Stinky before God. And, and I want to be found in him not having my own righteousness that comes from the law or what I do, how, how much I can do right and not do wrong, but that which comes through faith in Christ, a relationship, a relationship with Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. There it is. There it is. I want to know him. That's intimacy. I want to know you, Jesus. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. That's the victory. But also participate in his sufferings. That's pain and sorrow and hurt. And I've been praying for people who have been lost loved ones and are sick. And honestly, I can't explain it. But I understand now from Jesus in me what it was when it says Jesus is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Because I weep and I weep and I weep for hours. I have. For many of people in this church, and some of you online, some of you that haven't been able to come back, I cry. People that have lost loved ones, I weep because this life is that. Sufferings, becoming like him in his death, I die that Christ might live. And so somehow I attain the resurrection from the dead that I might live forever. And there's verse 11. That's what we all want, right? Do you love Jesus for who he is? I've gone long. Do you know that I don't know how to go short. But if it makes you get Jesus in your heart, that's okay. Would you stand with me? Pray this prayer. Jesus, forgive my sin. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given me and what you've done for me. What you provided, you died for me. You gave your life for me. You've given me many gifts. But Jesus, I want you to be the best gift. I want to be about us spending time together. I want to know you intimately, closely intimate 
intimacy, intimacy, intimacy. I want you to see in me and be honest. I don't want to hide anything. Just be honest. I need you. We're all sinners. I need you. These people need you, Jesus. We take time to be with you, Jesus. You teach us how to be a friend. Take time to be with you, Jesus. You teach us how to be holy. Take time to be with you, the living word. We walk with you, God. You fix us. So fix us. Fix those online. But those that need to call and be praying with them. They're watching online. 515-778-4524. They're praying they would call. And I'll definitely pray. In Jesus' name, I pray for everybody here. Holy Spirit of God, comfort those that are aching in their hearts. They've lost children. They've lost spouses. They've lost grandchildren. They've lost siblings, God. I pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit be with them and fill them up and put your arms around them right now. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Give him praise. He's good. Amen. Give him praise. Amen. Let's, Jesus is the greatest gift I give you. He's worthy of it all. Let me tell you, I've got two $100 bills in my pocket. And if there's someone here who's going, I could u- really use some money. Okay. Jackie, that's not you. I'm sorry. You'd give it away. But if someone is here, I just felt that to say, if you need some money, and I can get more where that comes from, I'll, you find me. I'll be at the front. Okay? I love all y'all. Pastors love all y'all. Every one of our cell numbers are published. They're online. Just look under the staff. We're accessible all the time. Text us. Tell us who you are. I'm from New Home. My name is. But I like it if you do go, go for me first. Because I'm the most relational animal you ever met in your life. I live, breathe. My, my hobby is people. Everything. Well, besides Baylor. And they're going to win Saturday on the first. They're going to win. Taking down Mississippi. Those people are hillbillies down there. They're going down. In Jesus' name, they're going down. They're Baptists. They know how to pray in the name of Jesus. Bless you. Know Jesus. If you're visiting, come back and see us. We've got younger pastors that don't preach so long. Okay? God bless you and have a beautiful day. Hallelujah. Lord.